John chapter 20, verse 24. We kind of, kind of touched on it a little bit last week. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them with Jesus when Jesus first showed up. So all the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But as many of us would be, he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, so I want to see it and touch it. And place my hand into his side. Touch everywhere. <laughs> I would never believe. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of people in the world these days. In fact, sounds like a lot of Christians these days is that when there are reports of healing, signs and wonders and miracles, and you would talk to some believers and they'll say, well, I don't really believe it. I will believe it when I see it. You know, you pray for people, you know, you, you pray and you command the sickness to go. And some people got healed instantaneously. Other people didn't get healed. And so they, they kind of get the doubt up. And then they, they basically say, I can't believe God because he hasn't healed me. So I will only believe when he heals me. Well, I wonder what Jesus think about those people. Let's find out, okay? Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas now was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, You doubting Thomas, what's wrong with you? I'm just going to cast you out of my kingdom. Did he do that? Well, this is what he said. He said, Thomas, okay, come, put your finger right here. Just do it. See my hands. And put your hand and place it in my side. Do not, do, not, do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. I want to focus on verse 27, which is an amazing response. You know, a lot of times we kind of, kind of look down on people that don't have the faith. You know, and in fact, in the old days... You ask preachers to pray for you, and if they pray for you and, and nothing happened, they actually blame on you. They say, is your sin, your doubt? What's wrong with you? And so, basically, they're saying to you that, you know, God is not pleased with you. Not to mention that, you know, it could be that they are the problem. They may be living in sin or whatever, right, if they want to go with that theology. But never mind, they always put burden on people. And say, you know, it's your sin, that's why you're not healed. Or because you don't believe and therefore you are not healed. Jesus never did that. In fact, when he was on, he was on earth three and a half years, every time when he sees people who are in pain and suffering, whether they had faith or not, he would heal them. And so now here, Thomas is one of the 12 general, as it were, in the kingdom of God. He was one of the 12 disciples that was going to change the world after Jesus would leave earth. And yet he could not believe after all the witnesses and testimonies had testified that Jesus had rose again. And Jesus himself had prophesied and spoken, predicted that he would be raised from the dead. And yet Thomas still didn't believe. You know, a lot of Christians, they hear a lot of sermons. And they were told that faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. yes. Are you here this morning? Can you talk back to me? And yet, because they keep on hearing, keep on hearing, they still don't find themselves having faith. They say, well, what is that? You know, I listen to, I see some of the people that have been listening to sermons forever, you know, thousands and thousands. Not only in this church, a lot of people have listened to thousands of sermons and they are as, as weak and, as, and struggling as much as those people that have just been saved. What's the problem? You know, here Thomas actually witnessed Jesus heal the sick, raise people from the dead. And yet he still couldn't believe. He was walking with Jesus all this time. Why is that? I don't know. I don't know why the people that listen to sermons forever, they still can't have faith to move mountain. Perhaps they haven't tried it. You know, the Bible says that faith without applying what you believe, i.e. work, is dead faith. So if you have faith, you need to try, you need to 
apply it and exercise it. Right? Don't just listen, listen, listen. That doesn't do anything for you. When you hear it, when you got to hear it, God give you faith, you apply that faith and see if it works. You know, on Friday night, we were teaching about, you know, teaching people how to pray for the sick. The reason is because I believe that every single person in this room who call themselves believers, that you are a candidate to pray for the sick, to see miracles happen. Are you here? It is not just my job or the job of a few in the church. It's the job of every believer to pray for the sick and see them healed. I absolutely believe that every believer is able to pray for the sick and see them transform and heal. You sitting here, you are one of the candidates that God wants to use you. We heard a sister, she was praying for people in the bathroom and somebody heard it. Before you know it, people will be coming in the bathroom to seek for healing from her in her workplace. That's the revival that God wants to bring to this generation is that every believer, doesn't matter how young, how old you are. In fact, I would challenge every single group, every group that are gathering in this church. You know, after church, some of you are gathering groups or whatever. You know, you organize your own lunch or whatever, or the youth group or the young adults. I challenge you. One of the things that you ought to do every single time when you meet together is to look for people to pray, to, to look for sick people to pray for. You know, the leaders of the group should ask, anybody sick here this morning? Anybody sick here today? Before we get to meal, let's just pray for somebody to get healed. You say, what if it doesn't work? It doesn't matter. What if it does work? Can you imagine you gather together, you know, like going to Alex and Mel, the home, you know, you guys about to eat food, you know, whatever. And, and, and so, uh, so uh, instead of doing, you know, other things, to chat, whatever, which is fine. But, you know, perhaps somebody say, oh, well, how, is there anybody that need to be prayed for? And someone who is cancer, it happens to be in that group, and you pray for the cancer, and the cancer got healed, glory to God, and all of a sudden, your meal will taste much better. <laughs> so I encourage you, you know, Thomas was able to see what Jesus is doing and so forth, and for years he followed Jesus and still wasn't able to believe. And many believers are like that. But I want, I got news for you this morning. Even if you feel like your faith is weak, never, never feel condemned or judged. Are you here? Do not feel condemned. You see, the way Jesus responded to Thomas was so amazing. You know, when our faith is weak, listen, Jesus would go to the place and the level where your faith is to lift you up. And it's what he did with Thomas. He said, you know, he knew Thomas didn't have faith. He didn't judge or condemn Thomas. He didn't tell Thomas, you know, you stupid fool, you know, what's wrong with you? I spent three and a half years and I raised the dead. I fed the 5,000 and the 4,000. And then I prayed for the sick to get healed. And yet you don't believe me. And you don't believe a word I said. You know, we human get mad when people don't believe what we say, right? What, you don't trust me or something? What, you don't trust me? You don't trust me? You don't trust me? You know? <laughs> but Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus went to the level where Thomas' faith was at. Whatever level that you're at this morning, whether you have strong faith, great and mighty faith, or you say, I have no faith, it's okay. Because if you're sincere, and Thomas was, Jesus will go to whatever level that you're at and he will lift you up from there. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus knew that Thomas' faith is the very common faith that the worldly people had. I will believe it when I see it. You tell people, you know, there's heaven after, you know, there's heaven and hell. And, you know, Jesus loves you. And, and you know, and they will say to you, I will believe it when I see him. You know, not only worldly people, Christians are like that too, you know. I was having a lunch with a, a, a concert promoter, um, uh, you know, and um, he, um, he, he is very, his company is well known. You may not know him personally, but his company is really well known. We actually, we're in youth and young adults together when we were young. And, you know, he's one of the guys responsible for bringing Hill Song into the country and bringing all those Youth Song United concert, whatever. And so we were having lunch together one day and, and uh, we, were, we were chit-chatting, you know, and, and uh, he was telling me how excited that the things are picking up with Hill Song and, and all the different groups he's bringing in and his business is just booming. And you know, people, you know, everybody wants to go and listen to Hillsong, right? So, and then he was so excited. And then there was a call came in, 
And uh, this call came in. Uh, this is a gentleman who actually we all went to youth group with also. He, um, he was on the other li- over the other line, and, and he was telling this gentleman, this friend of mine who was sitting with have lunch with me, uh, wanting his help to promote an evangelist that he is actually bringing um, to Toronto. And this evangelist from Vancouver, if I mention his name, you know immediately. He was, he was, um, he was huge, you know. And, um, and uh, sick were healed, and blind were, eyes were open. Amazing guy. And, uh, I mean, he, he eventually fell from grace. You know, that's another story. But he was really famous, and, and was really young. And, and uh, you know, he, his, uh, his initial is TB, you know. You can just figure out who that is, you know. He's responsible for a revival that happening in, uh, in a place called Lakeland, you know. So I, I can't give any more information without mentioning the name. So, you know, so, but he was just starting out. He was a Canadian, and... In Vancouver, and so, so, so my friend was listening to him and telling that fellow was telling him how amazing the miracles are, and and this guy actually could could pray for people over the phone and see them heal, and he demonstrated in many of his crusades, you know, when he was younger, before he got all the tattoos. But anyway, so um, my friend said to him, "I don't believe it." And you can hear the other guy on the other phone. What do you mean you don't believe it? This is amazing. God is doing. He said, I will believe it when I see it. <laughs> I was going to tell him, you yeah, little faith brother. Come on, man. <laughs> you know, but obviously he missed an opportunity because that, that evangelist become very famous, you know. Um, but anyways, so... Uh, so um, we, we all have that level. But we, sometimes we, we've been told because of our small faith, God can't do anything for us. That's not true. In His grace and mercy, He's able to do far exceedingly, abundantly, more than what you could ever imagine, even when you have little faith. Yes, it is true. You want to have great faith. Let me tell you this. On Friday night, I see there are two types of people in the kingdom of God. The one are the ones that are led by, their faith is being led by circumstances, i.e., I will believe it when I see it. So if the circumstances are no good, their faith are no good. But another group of believers is that their circumstances are led by their faith. They are actually five steps, even 10 or 20 steps ahead of their circumstances. They believe in God for such a great thing that it wouldn't even take place until 10 years later because they're so far ahead, their faith is so far ahead, they're actually leading the environment with their faith. They're leading the surrounding with their faith. They're not allowing the surrounding to lead their faith, but they're using their faith in God to lead the surrounding for healing, for provision, for spouse or whatever. They're way ahead of everybody. And most of the time, people will go, oh, that guy's crazy. It will never happen. But when it happens, everybody will go, ooh. God has called us to be faith people. The whole scripture teaches us about faith. Yes, it's true that he will come to the place where you are. But I'm going to encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't stay there. Because there's so many blessings for those who actually want to venture out and believe in God and allow themselves to have the kind of faith that will lead their circumstances. Anyways, Jesus was not mad with uh, Thomas. In fact, he would even insist that Thomas would... Do what he said he would do to prove to himself that Jesus was real. He may have been called a doubting Thomas by those religious people, yet Jesus never called him, you doubting Thomas. It's the name that we gave him. Jesus never gave him that. See, we are so easy to judge people, you see. Instead, Jesus came to the level of faith where Thomas was, and he encouraged him to believe. And what an encouragement it was. You know, it was an amazing encouragement. You know, church history tells us that Thomas became one of the mightiest general of faith in spreading the gospel. He took the gospel furthest away from Jerusalem. You know, we heard a lot about Paul the Apostle. But we hardly hear anything about Thomas. Do you realize that Thomas had took the gospel all the way to India? 
In fact, today there are monuments in India with Thomas there. And in fact, he was able to be, bold, be able to boldly proclaim the gospel until he was assassinated, murdered, or, or martyred for the Lord. And today, if you go to the place called Chennai in India, there's a monument, there's a church there. That's where he died, it was believed. He was able to go to places that most of the disciples were not called to go. You need great faith. Friends, if you want to go to places where you've never been, bringing a gospel uh, that never been heard by people, and there is a possibility that you would be killed, you would need great faith. Are you here? And Thomas had great faith. And you know, that's the pattern of Jesus. You see, Jesus never despised our failures in faith. Our failures in believing in him. He'd always go down to the level where we are. And he would lift us up. And before you know it, you will have that great faith to do great and mighty things for the Lord. I'll give you another example is Peter. You know, Peter had been told by Jesus, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crow. Peter said, no way, man. No way, Jose. I'm going to be absolutely in faith and follow you to death. And, you know, Jesus said, okay, whatever. And sure enough, he denied Jesus three times and he was so upset with himself, so ashamed of himself, you know. And yet Jesus never condemned him. In fact, Jesus knew that he was going to fall in spite of that, he had already put in place, preparing him. St. Peter, when you fail and you come back, strengthen your brother. See, what Jesus sees is not the failures we have. What he sees is what would happen when we come out of our failures with his great grace that would lift us up and encourage us and strengthen us. So a lot of times when we go to church, we feel like, oh, I'm not worthy. I don't think I can receive any healing because I don't really believe. Friends, let me tell you, don't worry about it. He is a good God. I say he's a good God. And he is able to go to where you at and lift you up from where you at and put you in the places where you can believe great things for the Lord. So he said, so, so Jesus said, so, okay. So after that, you know, Jesus said to him, okay, I want you to prove, your, prove it to yourself. Go ahead and try it out. You know, try it out and see what happens. And, and then that, now Thomas, all of a sudden Thomas is like, oh, for so guilty, right? He's like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry, right? That's pretty much what he said. He said, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? And the next statement is my concluding line. It could take a few minutes for me to conclude, but it's a concluding line nevertheless. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, the word blessed Jesus used is not some nice words that he would use like all of us. Oh, bless you, brother. What does that mean? When somebody comes to you and says, oh, bless you, brother, bless you, sister. It means nothing until you, unless you follow up with some action, yeah? James says this, you know, if you've seen a brother who is poor, and you say, God be with you and bless you and do nothing, it's useless. Your words is absolutely useless. Don't go and tell people to be blessed. If you actually just want to be nice, just say, you know, you know, don't, don't, don't use the word bless. You know, that word bless has a lot of meaning in it. Next time you want to bless somebody, be prepared to take them out for lunch. Are you here? Oh, bless you, brother. Really? Where are we going for lunch? I dare you to ask that, you know. <laughs> Next time people go, oh, bless you, sister. Oh, what are we eating today? <laughs> Glory to God, you know. <laughs> you can't say bless people and without following with some action. And that's the problem with our North American culture is we use words very lightly. 
very lightly. But for Jesus, when he say blessed, you know, you go to the Beatitudes and all those places, you see him blessed. You know, most people, it doesn't really hit them because they use, they, 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 they try to comprehend that word and all the statements Jesus made from the, from, the, from the modern vernacular, from the modern language or modern meaning. So it becomes very meaningless. You know, the Beatitude, for most people, is quite meaningless. Blessed are the poor, you know. Blessed are the brokenhearted, you know. Blessed, what, what does that mean? Because in our culture, it means nothing. I did research on the word bless. And um, there's a lot of meaning of the word blessed, right? But this is what Jesus, I believe what Jesus had meant. It's one of the meaning in the Greek text, you know. Being blessed is not just a nice thing to say for Jesus. It actually means something. By one definition, it is defined as, check this out, possessing the favor of God. You say, what is that? Honey, if you know the favor of God, man, I tell you, doors will be open like you never know. And many of the people here in this church have experienced the favor of God in getting a job, in getting a beautiful spouse, you know? I'm telling you, me included. And don't think it's just me. Come on. Don't think it's just me. My wife would say the same thing. Ah, ah. <laughs> it was the favor of God that was on her that she got me. Come on. Shaka, you know. <laughs> we always want one way street, you know. It gotta be both ways. Yes, it's the favor. You know, sometimes I look at her picture. I say, man, she's so beautiful. Wow, it's amazing. You know, I still appreciate her beauty. You know, she hates that. So I'm gonna stop right now. You know, you, you've you heard many stories of people who have great favor. You know, there'll be people coming out to you if you have the favor of God. They'll say things to you like, I don't know what it is, but I just want to bless you. Many of us Christians, you know, we've been Christian for a long time. We haven't experienced the favor of God and favor of man. You know, the Bible said Jesus grew in favor and stature before God and before man. He grew in favor. We ought to grow in favor. So if you've been pro having problems with getting a job or getting a spouse, or, you know, you, begin, you need to go, start to go into that favor. You don't do a study on favor. God, I need favors from you. I need open doors. I need, you know, the Bible says, given, it shall be given unto you, and man shall be given to your bosom. You know, that's favor. Man will actually give into your bosom, you know, people, people have no reason, you know, uh, my sister, what, my second sister, the, not the oldest one, but Ruby, she had that favor, and when I was younger, I just didn't understand that, you know, like, you know, I love Jesus, I love God, and, you know, and, and then one day, our pastor, we were kind of going to a, a church briefly together, and the pastor of that church decided to give her, how much is it, $99, now, she was going to University of Waterloo, and she was on a work term making big bucks. For those of you who go to Waterloo, when you go to work term, you don't get minimum wages. You get like $15, $20, even $30, $30 an hour. She was, like, she was like a high flyer. She was the only one to have a car. None of us had a car. It's like I took a bus. And she received this check. She was so happy, you know. She's like, what did you get? Nothing. And, you know, I always say, you know, that pastor, he's really, he doesn't know God, man. He, he had no prophetic inclination because if he knew he had a word of knowledge, you'd know that I did it, why didn't she did? You know? <laughs> oh, forgive, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. <laughs> you know what it is? The favor of God is in spite of your circumstance. You know, Jesus said that the one who has more will be given to him. That's a favor of God. You know, some of us, you know, are so, you know, struggling and financially and struggling in relationship. And then we see some, some guy like Pastor Paul, you know. And we say to the Lord, why are you blessing him more? Why don't you give some of that to me? That's not how the favor of God works. 
The one who has, more will be given. Are you here? So you want to go on the half side. You didn't get that. You want to go on the half side, and more will be given. Because if you haven't got that, have not, then you say, God, I need your grace. I know it's not my own ability, but it's your great grace. Your, your, your amazing great grace. Lord, I lean on you. I trust you. Favor is really important. Favor can put us ahead all the time. You can work hard. Sure, of course you can work hard. I remember when I was growing up, you know, working in a secular world, you know, every promotion I had, I often tell people this joke, I did not know why I had them. And I sure was hoping that I would never get found out by doing the job that everybody could do, and yet they'd pick me. You know, sometimes I'll be, be thinking to myself, I hope they, they never figure out that any monkey can do this work. <laughs> and they pay me, Ooh, those are money to do this. And it's like, I was thinking to myself, this is really, there's no justice in this. I was telling my, I was telling my daughter, you know, when I was in the height of my career, you know, I, 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 I'm, I don't report to anybody anymore in this country. So my boss is actually all the way down in Colorado. I mean, what are they going to do in Colorado? They can't see me, right? I'm like my own man, you know, traveling all over, you know. And, and, um, and I calculated the number of hours that I actually worked out. It was like five hours a day. <laughs> but they kept me in the job because God's favor was on me. He caused me to produce and continue to be productive and be one of the top guys. And so they just, they just, they just love me. My boss, actually, the president of the company, CEO, flew up to Canada just to hang out with me. Wasn't that good? <laughs> that was great. And he thought I was this talented guy. I was like, inside of me, I was like, thank you, Lord. I know I would never be found out because your favor is on me, you know? <laughs> so the favor is good. So Jesus say, see, you know, that when Jesus said blessed, he means that you have his favor on you. If you can believe without seeing, he's going to start pouring out his favor on you. That's his promise. He said, blessed, you know. So number one is favor, right? And number two is that um, uh, it's, it's, you, will be found, you will find yourself in that state of being marked by the fullness from God. What does that mean? You are marked by the fullness from God. You know, when you have, when you're blessed, when Jesus, you're blessed, you believe without being seeing it, believe without touching it, you believe, which many of us do. You become the envy of those who are around you. You are marked with the fullness of God. What is that? Man, I tell you, you can walk with the fullness of God. Wow, let me give you one example. The fullness of God means that His glory is on you. You know, the Bible defined the glory of God as His goodness. You say, where do I find that? It's in Deuteronomy. When, uh, sorry, in Exodus, you know, when Moses was asking the Lord, I want, to see your, I want to see your glory. And God says, you know, it'll kill you, but I will let my goodness pass before you. So God Himself defined His glory as goodness. So when you have the fullness of God on you, you have the fullness of the goodness of God on you. Not only you have favor, you have blessings, you have peace, your relationship is well, you do well, you excel in everything that you put your hands on. And more importantly, when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. They will get healed. You say, I'm not going to believe until you see it. Well, see, that's your problem. You won't get that blessing. Yet Jesus will come to the place where you're at because of his great grace to pull you up and say, it's okay, we're going to try again next time. If you don't believe this time, he said, I'm going to show you how good I am. Let's try it again next time. Until you're able to believe without seeing, without touching. So that his blessing, why? So that his blessing can come on you and you become what he called blessed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now, can I have the music team to come out? I'm going to close. 
You know, religious people would want us to strive and strive and strive and strive. But the grace of God says rest and trust. Rest and trust. Rest and trust. Even if you don't see it, rest and trust. Then I will pour out my blessing on you. I'll pour out my favor on you. And I'll pour out the fullness, not just half of it, fullness of my goodness over you. This is our heritage. This is our portion. This is our inheritance. And we need to believe that God wants to bless us, wants to have his goodness all over us, wants to give us favor. 